This is the part that I'm super excited to show you about, so, right? As Greg mentioned, Project Omicron. So my favorite part of our Verizon credo, right, is these two lines. We don't wait for the future. We build it, right? And so the way we do that, the way we exemplify in our contact analytics uh, team is through Wiz Labs, right? So Wiz Labs is a concept where Wiz Lab is a concept where we would build concept dashboards. This is similar to like uh, automobile companies building concept cars, right? So concept cars, they are real? Yes, they are. Are they drivable? Yes, they are. Are they in mass production? No. But they, they, they do push innovation and push the envelope forward. So that's the idea here. And there are two rules for Wiz Labs. One is, I would say three rules, okay? The first rule is it has to be an uncalled for project, right? And I use uncalled for in a in a good sense here, where it's not a client request, it's not a report that you have to generate to uh, uh, satisfy someone in the, uh, higher in the chain of command. It has to be a project that's conceptualized, idealized by the team members. Two is it should be an interesting problem to solve, and you should think fundamentally and through first principles to solve that problem. So even if uh, certain things have been done before, you should still think on a first principle basis. And and number three is, I'll get back to number three when I'll showcase some of the geospatial views that it, it, it pertains to that. So, number, okay, let, let me bring that in. So number three is that uh, you have to glean something interesting from your day-to-day -day life. And so what, what, by that I mean you have to take inspiration from a non-work-related environment, right? And so I encourage everyone in the team to you know, build something, at least one uncalled for project in the year that's built uh, by themselves, which they own. Uh, so for my uncalled for project is the Project Omicron, and I'll start with sharing some inspirations that I glean from you know, uh, everyday life, which my past working environments in, in general. So you know, this reminds me of my days of trading. So this is the opening bell on CNBC, so you can see the S&P 500 heat map, and in real time, it essentially shows you the market sentiment right when the bell rings, right? So stocks that have gone up, stocks that have gone down, uh, it's a heat map to get a sense of, okay, is the market, how's the market going to, gonna, or at least has started to perform today, right? So I find that pretty cool. I used to uh, you know, follow the S&P 500 heat maps quite a lot. One other one, uh, due to my currency trading days, what I want you to focus on is on the, those area charts on the top right corner. So what these show you is actually a real-time visualization of demand and supply. So those red and green graphs that you see, those are the, that's the bid-ask spread, where you see the ask price and the bid price uh, getting affected in real-time, and it equilibrates, and the order gets placed, and the price is uh, decided. And so you can view in some of the trading platforms in real-time how a particular uh, financial instrument is driving demand or supply. So that's something really exciting to me. There's a, there's a pretty cool show on Netflix, which is on a, a nuclear disaster that happened. And so in the, in the, in the, in the nuclear plant, in the, in the control room, you can see the graphite rods going up and down. And it's this anomalous behavior. And the way they visualize in the, in the control room is through uh, certain systems that they've built, right? So the core of the nuclear reactor is, an, is like an octagon. And each graphite rod is a square. So it's, it's, it's super interesting to think about it. Like this is actually some spatial mapping happening here. Right? So each square has a shape ID. Each point of the square has a point ID. And there's a, there's a path column that sort of maps the square to the octagon, which is the map, actually. I am deeply fond of uh, geospatial mapping. And I follow uh, certain ride-sharing uh, data visualization projects uh, from certain ride-sharing companies. And one of the best, uh, real, really powerful visualization that I got to see was you know, the, the effect of separate trips versus uh, carpooling. So this is real-time visualization of congestion. And you can see the, like there's a significant difference between like the heat maps uh, on the street. So it's actually uh, at the ride-sharing company, the chief economist uh, was shown this visualization. It was an instrumental part uh, for that company to start the carpooling uh, process. So uh, there are less cars on the road. It's good for the environment. Customers uh, get cheaper rides. It's good for the drivers. Their, their rides are not uh, wasted. Uh, and it's less expense for the company. So the data is there. The data is there in the company. Uh, it's, it's, you have to find a way to visualize and to tell that story, which actually affects uh, decisions majorly in the direction of the company. Another view is basically hexagons uh, on top of a geospatial map, 
which was interesting. So these are actually the number of cars and not the time congestion that's in the traffic. So that's pretty, pretty stark difference with separate trips and carpooling. And then some of the visualization that we've done before, right? So geospatial mapping, we've done, we've done the, like the heat maps, geospatial heat maps. So what this does is it shows, identify the pockets of zip codes where certain dispatches are high. And then you can click on certain states and you can filter on certain trouble types and really dive deep into certain pockets of zip codes which you won't find like in a, in a tabular view. We've also done satellite maps. This is a Mapbox satellite map uh, integrated in Tableau where it finds actual households that have generated dispatch. You can plug in the thresholds, it'll find you if a household has generated more than X number of dispatches. And you can click on that red dot to uh, actually view the infrastructure on the ground. So you know, this is Google Street View API integration within Tableau. That'll show you that. So when you think about geospatial mapping, I mean, when you think about spatial mapping, we usually think about it's like an outdoors geospatial mapping, right? But uh, I mean, if you think about it, everything is coordinates. It's an X coordinate or Y coordinate. I mean, it's, uh, if the matrix is real, the programmer has essentially in the, in the schema, he has three columns, the X, the Y, and the Z coordinate. It's essentially geospatial mapping in a three dimension. Basically, uh, you would do that to animate. So uh, what I was thinking is how cool it would be to, to take some of the outdoor geospatial techniques indoors and actually try to start viewing operational efficiency in our call centers on the floor. So it's, that was something really interesting for me to work on the data for that. So if you see each, each Pentagon pod is, you could, that is a shape, and so you can allocate a shape ID to that. Each point of that Pentagon is a point. There's a point ID for that, and the way it moves in the progression, you would set a file path for it to complete a workstation. And so the idea here was to, it'll be, it'll be awesome if the supervisors on the call center floor can get to see near real time some of the operational metrics that's happening in the call center. So consider like an event like, a, like phone launches, like outages, weather-related events, what, how, how, like how is the AHT being performed in near real time for some of these uh, uh, parts that are there? So to give you a sense, bringing all the inspirations together, you see the supply and demand of calls in the left chart. So you see the calls received, and then you see the calls answered, right? That's the ask price and the bid price in the stock market that you just see. So calls received, the demand for customers for them to resolve their issues. Calls answered, the customer representatives that we are supplying for uh, uh, resolving the issues. Other, other metrics, average handle time, hold time, stock times, transfers, tickets open, tickets resolved. You know, you could, you could really visualize a heat map of the actual call center floor with respect to any metric. So if you, if you would want to visualize uh, something that's gone above a threshold, in the real time, you can see what that part is. The supervisor can, can start thinking about how, do you, how to start resolving that. Right? And when you take it near real time, you're starting to solve optimization problems. So in the previous graphs that you saw, okay, we looked at historical time trends, we looked at something's gone up, okay, an anomaly is detected, but that's always like uh, a week after or a one day after. Like we don't really have any chance to resolve for that. But if you have something like this, you can take actions. This is quite actionable if, uh, if, it, if it gets implemented. So uh, how would something like this look like when it's changing, right? So this is, this is a sped up animation, but uh, you could consider this like a time lapse of the entire day's uh, activity, right? So on a, on a minute by minute basis, or on an hour by hour basis, you can see the calls coming in, you can see the calls getting answered from where they're getting answered, right? You can see the uh, certain KPIs going up or down. You would click on an individual part to see how that rep has performed historically for, with respect to certain metrics, et cetera. Right? And to take this next level further, how cool it would be for anyone, of course, who has the permissions and who has the access and who is the right stakeholder, anyone from anywhere can view the call center floor of any call center anytime. Right? This is like a data-driven ring or a canary for the enterprise business. 